Pastor Dorothy and I are certainly happy to be once again back with you and uh, have some fond memories of many of the times that we have uh, seen people either in Ontario or when we've been able to come over. It's one of the blessings of, of the Brotherhood. Now you've had a little time to look at the diagram on the screen, so I hope that you've all come to some resolution as to why we would put that tree on the screen. Some of you may remember to the time when my brother Ron was doing some talks in Australia and he was doing them on uh, 2 Corinthians. And this study is one of his studies that he never got finished. And I picked up the notes that he had and uh, I noticed where he was going with it and uh, we have had some interesting times since 1983. I think I had to give a talk on this topic, or at least I chose to speak on this topic at a, at a study day in Williamsville, New York. And uh, the weekend prior to giving the, the talk, I broke my leg. So I gave the talk sitting down with my leg up. I've never ever had to give a set of talks like that before, but that topic was kind of appropriate. Now, there's a little story to introduce this, and uh, it illustrate where I want to go with the topic tonight. Um, probably 20, 30 years ago in Shelburne, uh, we had quite a lot of success with the seminars. In fact, we had so much success on one particular session where we had about 20 people, and we had about eight baptisms out of that 20 people. It took quite a while to get eight baptisms, but we had a really powerful group. And one of the ladies of this group was a, a person who didn't live too far from the hall, and she was homeschooling. And she had about six children, and she was homeschooling all these children. She seemed to be a very strong individual, and she was uh, attending not only uh, these classes, uh, she wasn't actually attending the, the full set of seminar, uh, seminar classes, but she was attending some classes that the sisters were having and um, was becoming more and more vocal about what she believed. She seemed to think that the idea of uh, the Bible being true and the idea of uh, you know, the moral life that we were called to was, was quite significant. She was trying to teach her children this. But after a while we found out that <clears throat> she had quite different beliefs. And it came about in a, in a rather unusual way. Since she was uh, homeschooling and looking after her children, she seemed to have quite a strong view about how to raise children. And uh, she seemed to think that the best advice was actually found on, a, on the bookshelf of the stores. And uh, there was a doctor, doctor, uh, not Hans Selye, it was a Dr. Dwayne Dyer. And he wrote a book called How to Raise Happy Kids. And she was circulating this book amongst the sisters. And uh, my daughter Martha came to me one day and she says, Dad, I think you should read this book. Just see what you think. Well, you know, it's not something you just want to sit down and do. You have a lot of other things to do. But I thought maybe it would be a good idea to, to do this because I knew this, this lady was having quite an influence on all the sisters. Well, I tell you, when I read that book, it occurred to me immediately that if anybody ever raised their kids by the way this man was saying to raise your kids, one thing would be guaranteed they'd never be in the kingdom. Because one thing that this man disagreed with is that you ever teach children uh, what, they should, what they should know or what they should do spiritually at, the, at an early age. You, you, let, you let them grow up and let them make their own decisions on these things. Now this is not something new. I'm sure you've, you've heard of this philosophy. But the point about it that struck me was, why was it that our sisters were reading these books and then we got talking about it, and the sisters would say, well, we, we really don't have many books on how to raise kids, and, and yeah, we did have a lot of children. There was a very big Sunday school. And I thought, you know, we really have to do a little more in this activity of trying to help people 
who are running off to find books or anything they can to how deal with you know some of the children that are a little more difficult to handle. So that got me looking into some of these books and uh, this idea of the stress of life was just one such thing and I want to show you that. So if you can see those are the two important aspects of the slide coming up. One is what does the world mean by stress and then you can see that it's it's actually a website <clears throat> called a help guide to stress. Now that may be how people answer those kinds of questions today like I can't you know, find a chapter that tells me how to raise children or how to deal with the stress of my life. I can't find a book in the ecclesial bookshelf that deals directly with stress. So let's do a little sampling to see what's out there. Well, this is what's out there. Now some of this, you see, this is, this is the situation with the world. Some of it is quite practical and, and quite instructive. But when it deviates from that, sometimes it's hard to, to see. And when it deviates, it really deviates from what we believe. So let's just read this together. The stress response <clears throat> also helps you rise to meet challenges. Stress is what keeps you on your toes during a presentation at work. Sharpens your concentration when you're attempting the game-winning throw. Or drives you to study for an exam when you'd rather be watching TV. But beyond a certain point, Stress stops being helpful and starts causing major damage to your health, your mood, your productivity, your relationships, and your quality of life. Well, that would probably have a ring of truth to it for anybody who knows stress. Because if you're working in an environment like we are today, you find your boss tells you, well, you know, we, did a, we had a good year last year for the company, but we'd like to have a better year and uh, what that means is there's going to be one less employee to do the same work. And the next year it's the same thing. We had a wonderful year last year. The banks in Canada have been making about a billion dollars of profit a, a year for quite a few years. But right now they're making a billion dollars of profit per quarter. And it's largely out of downsizing, getting more, uh, more work out of less people. You think that causes stress? Yeah, there's a lot of truth about the stress out there. So he goes on to say, when, or the website does, when you per perceive a threat, your nervous system responds by releasing a flood of stress hormones, including adrenaline and cortisol. These hormones rouse the body for emergency action. Your heart pounds faster, muscles tighten, blood pressure rises, breath quickens, your senses become sharper. These physical changes increase your strength and stamina, speed your reaction time, enhance your focus, preparing you to either fight or flee from the danger at hand. And you see it once again, like we, we've seen this, we, we know that, we, we've been in a stressful situation. We know that our blood pressure rises, we know that we breathe, we breathe faster. We know that in our personal life, when we get into a stressful situation, we're either of the type that fights or we're the type that flees. And that's just one of the things that the world has recognized about the common aspects of how humans respond to this. So they say you're one of three types. You're either a person who puts the foot on the gas, an angry or agitated stress response. You're heated, keyed up, overly emotional and unable to sit still. Or you put the foot on the brake. A withdrawn or depressed stress response. You shut down, space out, show very little energy or emotion. And then there's the people that put their foot on both. Which is like what happens when you're facing an impact and you can see it coming. You just put both feet down. A tense and frozen stress response. You freeze under pressure, can't do anything. You look paralyzed but under the surface you're extremely agitated. You see, well by the time you've read these things you think hey, this, this is kind of somewhat instructive, like I can learn from this because many of these things I've experienced. And that's where a lot of people think that the rest that comes must be equally valuable. 
Now, I don't know if you ever heard this man or ever read anything that he's written. This happens, he happens to be a Canadian. He comes out of Montreal. Uh, I'm not even sure he's still alive because uh, he was an old man who wrote this book. But he was recognized to be the stress guru. And the book that you see there, Stress Without Distress, is the book he wrote to help people understand how to deal with stress. But now look a little sample of what he wrote. Is this the best advice? He says, I have emphasized, perhaps irritatingly often, that egotism is an inherent and unavoidable characteristic of life. Yet pure egotism necessarily leads to conflict and insecurity within the community. Sometimes brutal sacrifice is indispensable to protect living nature as a whole. In battle, a general must occasionally reach the painful decision of sacrificing a platoon or even a regiment to save an army. But the most efficient and pleasant way of combining the advantages of the few with those of the many is the principle of altruistic egotism. Are you any wiser? What would anybody mean by altruistic egotism? Altruism is when you do something to benefit uh, other people or the, the greater number. Egotism is when you do something to favor yourself. So you see, they coin a word. That sells books because no one really knows what they mean. And, you know, if you wanted to know more about what he means, you have to read the book. That's clever. But that's what gets people into trouble because, you see, you start to get hooked on this and think, well, yeah, reasonable, reasonable. Maybe I can learn something of how to deal with my stress. And here's more like reality because these were a couple articles that Ron had gleaned from, so you can see the date on it, July 1978. But I don't think they're any different now than they would have been then. Burnout in the health profession. Now, burnout is is if you sort of made out that tree, you got the idea of a tree that was burned out, but yet there was a little bit of the tree that was alive, and actually it started to grow again. And that's the concept of burnout that we're really talking about in a human life. So it says you entered nursing to help people, do good for humanity, make life and death more comfortable for fellow human beings. Then one day you're ashamed because you yelled at a patient. Another day you cry over the cruelty of death. You slip into days of avoiding patients or even making fun of patients' personalities or illness. You begin to dread work. You become cynical about nursing. And you're ashamed of yourself for feeling that way. You become disgusted. This progression to disillusionment or burnout is one of nursing's hazards. Well, really, it's a hazard of every caring profession where people actually do a lot or spend a lot of time caring for others. And, yeah, you get to the point where that's what they call it, burnout. They also call it the marshmallow syndrome. Marshmallow being that you put a marshmallow in the fire, you take it out when it's hot, you can pull off the skin and you can eat it, and there's actually a little bit of marshmallow left to do it again. That's why burnout was called a marshmallow syndrome, because you, you can only go through life a couple times like this until there's nothing left. But burnout doesn't mean necessarily a person's finished, but they're never quite the same. And that's what they're talking about. And they recognize it happens regularly in the health profession. Here's a, an article that uh, Ron had gleaned from the Business Harvard Review. I don't think this is any different than it is today either. It says, it was just after the birth of the third child, eight years ago. The birth coincided with a move to another part of the country and with a complete change in job. There I have to admit that I was completely unaware of the consequences that all this had for my wife. She was overloaded with work and worries. It went on for some time and I just wasn't aware of what was happening. Finally, she fell ill and had to be hospitalized. It was only then that it began to dawn on me I was quite unconscious of everything I was doing. Well, there's a lot of people so busy, they don't really watch what's happening at home. And you can see that uh, there must be as many people today suffering the same problem. On the road all the time. Not even any peace uh, when they're in a, in a, 
an airport. You see the man sitting in a chair talking and talking. Well, he's talking to someone on a cell phone, but he, he's, he can use any place as his business office. How do anyone, as anyone today in today's business world, actually find some rest or relaxation? So, yes, stress in that case does spill over into the family, and uh, people act differently because of it. Now, there is a book that was written about stress in the Brotherhood. Brother Dennis Glett, He Healeth All Thy Diseases. And I thought it was important to just make a little quote from his book, just to illustrate what he's talking about. He says, to put it plainly, bodily stress and spiritual stress are inextricably interwoven. Nearly always when the soul is suffering from tension, it is because the powers of the mind and body are overstretched. Spiritual work often involves the use of bodily powers and always the use of the mind. In these circumstances, when the body is worn and weary, so is the spirit. When the mind is distraught and distracted, spiritual exercise is a burden and a drag. So the disciple who is overworked and overwrought can rarely be overjoyed in the truth. So one shouldn't think that just because we're not part of the world out there, we're not part of that business world or of the nursing world or something else, that Therefore, the stress wouldn't be in the brotherhood, what well, it surely is. And I don't think I have to tell you that. I think people would recognize that. We know what stress is. And we recognize, honestly, that in some cases it, it does get us into trouble. Now, here's a, another little take from his book, because it tells you uh, something that may be even more ring a bell even clearer than the other one. It says, In the worst experience of stress, the work of the truth becomes a nuisance, something which aggravates the anxiety and intensifies the pressure. It tightens the timetable of life, adds weight to the burden and irritation to the mind. The neglect of the truth, which the stress enforces, introduces a feeling of guilt, which in turn adds to the general disability. Everything is done in a hurry, and the hurrying becomes harrowing. Even sleep is without rest. Long days, short nights, to bed tired, from bed tired. Feeding is a habit more than a pleasure. The ringing telephone, a jangle, visiting friends, and interference. Family fellowship takes a cut. Is that something similar to life in Australia, or does that only happen in Britain? Well, I would say it certainly happens in Canada, and I would think that any of us who are really busy in life and trying to be really busy in the truth must at times feel something similar to that, a feeling of guilt because we just didn't get the time we wanted to put into something. We weren't able to do everything we wanted to achieve, and it leaves us feeling quite bad about it. But why, why should life be like that, brothers and sisters? Like, are we not in control of it? You know, what adds even more to it is that when you look at the Bible, God says, you know, I want the best. He always says that. Well, for a priest, you couldn't be a priest till you're 30. And when you're 50, you're out of it. You could do other things, but, but in terms of you know, the, the priesthood that he talks about and the activities of a priest in the tabernacle, 30 to 50. Now, who would like to have you from 30 to 50 but the employers of the world who recognize that that's when you've got the greatest to offer is from 30 to 50. But after 50, well, you haven't got quite so much. And even the Levites, 20 to 60. And when you look at the value of, of the person associated with, uh, you know, a vow, after 60, we don't rank very high. And it illustrates, you've got to get the most out of life when God expects us to have the most in life. And if this is the way it continues until the world doesn't want us anymore because well, we're too old anyway, and we find that, you know, yeah, we don't 
think as well. We don't uh, we don't act as well at, at you know 9:30 at night. We can't think anymore. Uh, all these things illustrate the stress in the brotherhood. Just think about Brother Roberts. You know, you need sometimes. The way that the Bible is written is that really, if you, if you look at the Bible, you would never, ever feel that your stress is greater than anybody else's. And then when you look at the life of Robert Roberts, as it says here, between these two lectures, that is, November 22nd, a knife was plunged into the editor's heart by the death of a charming son of four years called after Dr. Thomas. Sorrow upon sorrow. His sister, two years old, called after Sister Thomas, has since above the above, was in, in type, died of the same disease. And if you really wanted to know more, you should have a look at the time that that happened in his life. You can see it's 1872. And just see what happened when people started writing to Robert Roberts to comfort him. And what kind of letters he received for comfort. With some people even suggesting to Brother Roberts things that the, the truth doesn't support. That he would see these sons again sometimes. Or take comfort, you'll see your son, you'll see your daughter again. And see his answer to those, to those people. So it wasn't just the actual action that happened or the, or the things that happened in his life. It was how he had to deal with people who were trying to comfort him with false comfort. He wouldn't accept it. Talk about stress. We really have to put it, you know, in a, in a category to see it. So we want to go back to this tree and just want to have a little look at, at some of these things again. Because God gives us these things to see in life. There are many, many things you can see in life you think, well, that reminds me of something. Like there's an old tree at the back of our hall that has, uh, it, it actually blew over in a windstorm. We had to, had to cut it down. And we cut it down there was a big stump there. The stump was so big we'd never actually have moved it, so it's sitting there. But it's one of these stumps that'll never grow again. In the Bible, it says, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. See, you're walking by that stump, and, you, and if you're thinking what the Bible says, you see a reinforcement in something that's actually happened in life. Well, on the other side of the, of the garden, there is a, a tree we cut down because it, it, it was actually uh, broken off in a storm. We cut it down, but it was a black walnut tree. And every year it tries to grow again. A little bit of water, that root brings up new shoots. One tree is twice dead. The other tree, by the taste of water, so to speak, it grows. Now what does God give us this for? But to remind us of how the truth actually should be taking hold of us. Some people are twice dead in that sense. And some people see that, you know, there's another beginning possible and start over. And, and I think the, the burned out tree, or this tree wasn't quite burned out, but obviously it had survived the fire. So the, these lovely words that come to us from Isaiah 40 illustrate there's, there's something the world totally misses when they don't open the Bible. Isaiah 40, verse 30, Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon Yahweh shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And if we don't learn to do that, brothers and sisters, in our mortal life, if we don't learn how to wait upon our Yahweh to have our strength renewed, we, if we don't see how David was able to strengthen himself in his God and, and in prayer to God was able to deal with, the, with what happened at Ziklag, then we shouldn't expect it will happen, you know, just sort of automatically someday in the kingdom. Now we've got to learn that waiting upon our God is a way to renew strength. You see it every now and then by a person who has been really weakened by something that's happened in their life, but the spirit of the person has never been dampened at all. In fact, this person is able to understand these things somehow as a, as a way of strength. And you come to comfort the person, you go home comforted, because the person has learned how to do this and how to be strengthened by God's word. Now that's the secret we want to have a look at. 
So let me a little list of words in the Bible associated with stress. Defrauded, chastened, suffer, overcome, anxious, covetousness, perplexity, not sure what the others are, uh, chastening, faint-hearted, purging press. There's a number of them that would be related to this. So this study really goes on for many nights, not just one night, to, to go through the breadth of how the Bible deals with this subject. Now, there is a toll of conscience. And uh, as we talked about the Brother Judd's book on how he could see that people who take the truth seriously really sometimes pay a, a higher toll because of their conscience. Well, look at these two verses. <clears throat> One says, James 4, verse 17, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So it, it's possible for us to go to bed and say, I, I didn't do something I, I planned to do today. And it's on our conscience. We should have done that today. And it may be that we were right prepared to do it and just didn't have the courage to do it. Just didn't have whatever it, it, it was missing to, to speak to a person about a matter that we really wanted to. And then in Romans 14, verse 22, it says, Has thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Well, in a sense, they're connected. But in another sense, they're not connected because one is things we didn't do and one could very well be things that we did do that we shouldn't have done. Well, if the truth doesn't affect us that way, then uh, we, we've got to maybe reconsider those verses. So it applies only to those who take the Bible seriously. Our conscience will keep prodding us over things we know we should be doing but are not doing. And our conscience will keep prodding us over things we should not be doing, but keep doing. The conscience, however, can be seared and no longer sensitive to these things. So, you know, we all have a little window of time when we're sensing these things to, to do something about it. Because not doing anything about it, your, your conscience will in time just retire. Just like an alarm clock that's wound up, it'll only ring for so long. And when the, it unwinds, it won't bother you anymore, but neither will you get up if you haven't heeded it. So that's a, an aspect that we must at least acknowledge when we come into this topic. Now this word, phlebo, a biblical word for stress, is where I think the study starts. It's not the only word. As you know, there were a number of words we showed you on the screen that you could use, but this is really a very instructive one. And, and Brother Ron led me to this because I didn't realize this when I started. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14 says, Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Well, there's your word, narrow, which means to crowd. Like Jesus was thronged by people, he was crowded by people. So it's to suffer tribulation, or to suffer anguish, or to be troubled. Narrow is the way which leads to life. Now, you must admit, I think, when you start looking at the Bible, the Bible teaches us a philosophy of life. In other words, by an accumulation of these verses, you, you approach life. As the world would say, you have a different world view because you see it through this philosophy where the world sees it through a philosophy without the Bible at all. Very, very different look at the same world. And so when we see this, it says, <clears throat> straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads unto life. You can see how if, if mothers persevere with kids, and yeah, if maybe we had a few more stories we could tell our children from a book that actually would take something like this up and would write a little story associated with it so that the children could see it was that very narrow 
way where they had to squeeze through things. They had to duck down for things. That's the way that led to life. They probably would be in a better position to accept this when they become of age to know what he's really talking about. So that we, we just lead them that way by the stories and the things that we tell them. Well, it, it comes again in this verse. Acts 14, verses 21-22. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium, to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that, that through we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Well, it's the same word, just a different form of the word, philipsis, but it means pressure. Now that's what I'm sure that led Brother Ron into talking about stress because in many cases those words are interchangeable. Pressure and stress. We're under pressure. You've got so much time to get this done. The pressure of the time is, is, uh, is on our shoulders very much. So when you think of pressure, it's through much pressure we enter into the kingdom of God. You, c you can see what God's trying to do with us. It's, it's not in one area. It's in many areas. It seems like in all areas we're under pressure. And that pressure is very valuable. Um, you know, sometimes a, li a little um, reckoning of, of something we've done in life helps us that. What helped me on, on this one, to understand this idea of pressure, was something that we were doing at the college in wood products. In the, uh, it was, mm, I would say, maybe 30 years ago. There was a, a fad out that you could buy cheap carvings. And one of the carvings that was, uh, people really wanted in Ontario was a carving of, of wagons with horses. And in particular, the Conestoga wagon. The college I went to was Conestoga College, and they'd actually made a wagon that looked like the old wagons that they used to run through the area. And someone had actually carved it out by hand. Very, very skilled person. It was a beautiful, you know, four horses and, and the wagon and uh, the, you know, the, the background of the trees. It was just a beautiful work. But he was the only person that could do that, and very costly. So they learned that, no, you could actually make a copy of this. And what you had to do was you had to put a, a rubber mold. And this rubber was liquid at a time. It would go over the mold. And it would, um, because it expanded a bit, it would go into every crest, a crevice of the mold. And when you pulled it back, you could, because it was rubber, it, it, you could get it off. If you put that mold in a box, and then you poured a foaming plastic over it. A foaming plastic is a, is, a, is a plastic that will harden and when it hardens it has little bubbles of carbon dioxide in it and depending on how long it, it bubbles and how much pressure you have on it, it can be very fine or it can be something like styrofoam which is quite weak. But the idea was to make it very fine. So you, you would put the, put the, the uh, r rubber mold in a box put this uh, plastic on it, let it foam, put a cover on it, and tighten it down, leave it for a while. But when you took that out, that was an exact replica of the carving. And the pressure of that foam went into every little crevice, and the detail it came out with was beautiful. So all, somebody went to work to paint it, and they tried to sell them. But people learned they were fake. They go up and you do that. If you did that with wood and you did that with plastic, you had quite a different sound. And if you tried to sell that for the, the, the going rate for a wood carving, people could easily tell that it was, it was just a, you know, like a veneer. It wasn't of any real value whatsoever. So it didn't get off the ground. And the college had put quite a bit of money into this, but it, uh, it didn't work. Just a little aside to t tell you about pressure and what you can do with pressure. Well, in this 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we now find a, a real treasure house for this topic. First of all, we are like fragile pottery. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
So earthen, well, it, just earthenware like we might expect, nothing new there. And excellence, or excellency, is a throwing beyond of others, a, a super eminence. That the excellency, that, that the, the glory of the matter may be of God and not of us. Now that's one of the verses that you put into the philosophy package. Because this is the way we go through life. And we try to tell people that, yeah, we go down different roads because sometimes of things that happen to us early in life. Some people are never going to be as big as other people. Some people have diseases and, and they have to carry that through their life. Some people's lives aren't very long. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And what we want to do is we want to show what God can do with an earthen vessel if we work on it. Now, it's this little expression, which I think is the gem of the night. It's my feelings of it. Because when you get to verse 4, if you have your Bibles there, and you see we're just going on verse 7, we're going to verse 8, it says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. That's the first uh, sort of analogy here. Troubled is that word flevo. So it is the word we're looking for. It means to crowd. We're crowded. We're pressured on every side, but we're not distressed. Distress means to hem in very closely, to, to cramp so that you can't move at all. That would be the idea of it. Now, you find a, a picture like this. and To my mind, it just illustrates the point so well. If something happened to that tree, it could very well be that there was a lot of water that got poured out just behind the tree and sort of washed out the bottom of it so the roots of the tree were essentially laid bare. But somehow or other, the tree had roots up high enough that sort of just grabbed onto it and continued growing anyway. And I thought, you know, this is, this is the way we find these words. We're troubled on every side, but we're not, you know, sort of left with no hope whatsoever. It's not as if it's hopeless. And when you see something like this, I think God's showing us. These are the, this is the world he gave us to live in of how other forms of life have learned to live with stress. He says we're dis perplexed, but not in despair. In other words, there doesn't appear to be any way out, but it's not as if there really isn't a way out. So perplexed is a word that just means no way out, at a loss. And despair is a word that suggests to be utterly at a loss. So that's just taking Strong's definition, the difference between the two words. So I don't, yeah, there is an exit sign here. That would be read in Ontario by law. So you have to, you'd have to see a sign that would be red lit. So if, if we were in a situation of a panic in this house, we, we were in this building, we would look for the exit sign. That's the way out. But if we did not see any exit sign, we would be in despair. There's no way out. And you can well imagine how that would be a problem in an emergency. Well, you think of this tree, and you think, uh, how would a tree possibly grow like that? And somehow or other, and every now and then, you do see a tree growing in an almost impossible situation where it, uh, it appears that there's just no way you, can, you could ever plant a tree and expect it to grow there. But without planting it, we do find trees growing like that. Now, sometimes these things are very, very helpful because when you get to the point of thinking, you know, why did God allow this to happen to me? Why me? Other people have their life ahead of them. Other people can do this and that. And here am I in this very disadvantaged position. And then you see a tree like this. To, if you'll straight, well, you know, it's what you make of it. If you want to, you could uh, just say, well, just forget it. Just fall off the cliff and it's over. But really, that tree's growing. And it's growing straight. And it looks healthy. And it says something to us like the verse does. We're perplexed. We can't see a way out of this, but never to believe that there isn't a way out of it. That would be to lose faith altogether. And we don't want to be in that position. That's a, that's a, a mindset we must have. Persecuted, but not forsaken. 
And the idea, the idea is that, you know, you, you just feel whipped. You just feel out of it. And sometimes you can feel like you're abandoned. You've been left behind. Everybody else is gone. Well, the word persecuted means what we would expect. To pursue, to persecute. And the word forsaken means to leave behind in some place, to remain over. So that, uh, in a bad sense, to desert. So you're deserted. No, we, we might be persecuted. And we might be persecuted by people we would never expect would persecute us. But we're not abandoned. We're never left alone. So, <coughs> excuse me. You see this log. Now, you wouldn't expect the log would actually ever grow anything, but this log has. So, yes, again, if, if, if the log is cut down and it happens to be in water, that there is a chance that it will actually grow up again and, and grow a tree. Now, I don't know how a tree would ever grow very large in that position, I don't know, but there are some other pictures I have of illustrating how trees have grown in places. It's just unbelievable. And, and it's every now and then you see these things, and it's, it's just like seeing it in the Word of God. It's a beautiful figure of being persecuted, but not left behind, not abandoned. And then he says... You're cast down, but not destroyed. But you're, you know, I don't know if any of you know about boxing, of how people, uh, what I mean by saying down for the count. If you're in a boxing match and, and, a, and a person's knocked out, he has to, he has to be out for 10 seconds. If he's out, the, the bout's over. So that's the, the, the sort of the title of it. But cast down, but not destroyed has the same sense. That is to throw down... And destroyed means to perish. Yeah, so people might be cast down. You might be flat on your back, but, but not destroyed. And sometimes when we're flat on our back, it's not hard to think that we're destroyed, that we will never rise again. And, and if sometimes you, you talk to brothers and sisters who've been down on their back for a long, long time, but have been able to get back up and, uh, and put life back together. So, you know, a little picture like this of, of being flattened with uh, pave, pavement and yet uh, again give water and uh, these little shoots burst through the pavement and start growing. Gives us an idea of the idea that you could be cast down but not necessarily destroyed. Now why would he give us these figures? I mean this is just a beautiful little section verses 8 and 9. Troubled on every side, not distressed. Perplexed, not in despair. Persecuted, not forsaken. Cast down, not destroyed. I think the apostle would have understood that many people would have shared these feelings and they had to be told that with our God and with the philosophy that we have associated with his truth, we shouldn't feel that way. That because we go through these iterations in life, we can go through it many times, that we're not destroyed. It's only us that decide that we're destroyed until, of course, we can't think and, and we, we do die for one reason or another. Now, what I would like to do in the, in the little time we have left, and uh, this is where the study goes on and on, is just try to add to the, to the statements that the scriptures make to round out a mindset so that if you, if you really had all these things on a piece of paper and you could remember them, it would illustrate how to deal with the difficulties and the stress of life. Now this is one. In Psalm 119, it's not only found here, it is certainly found in many places. But it distinctively says to us in verse 75, I know, O Yahweh, that thy judgments are right. Always right. God is the standard of what is right. You see, and some people would not reason that way, having a different worldview all the time to think, well, you know, God let me down. Or God can't be right under these circumstances. You know, God is always right. I know, O Yahweh, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness 
has afflicted me. Let I pray thee thy merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Now can't you see that a person who will not look at God's word is, is just left out of this blessing? Because all the blessings are associated with God's law is his delight. And as he reads that law, and he understands that God's always right, and that in faithfulness God has afflicted us, that's a basic value we must have to understand stress. But if we don't read God's word, we would not know what Yahweh being right really means. Another one is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Well known. We understand these things. I beseech you, brethren, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now you can see, uh, I hope that I, I'm illustrating this well enough that you can see that our children really need to be rooted in this. That if we can't see or can't teach our children that the reason why we do the readings and the reason why our, our life is Bible-centered and the reason why we come to the meeting and the reason why we have friends and family members that are part of the Ecclesia it's because the Bible is basic to our life. You take out the Bible, we got nothing left. Nothing left. I remember at Allen Gardens, people used to love to come up to you and, and they would say, close this book. And they would take your Bible if you let them and they would close your book. And they'd say, now talk to me. And the only thing you could say to them, I got nothing to say. If you close this book, I have nothing to say to you. Because everything I'm saying to you has got to be based in this book. Now we can close the book in our life by not opening it enough to get this kind of a value system. But when you understand that the whole idea is to be transformed, then you get a view of what God's doing with us and how things should be understood that are happening to us. That's a major understanding that differs us from the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 and 9. You'll remember this as well. And Paul says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul's reaction, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now that's not something that you would go boasting about without ever having had any experience in it. So that there may be certain things that we've had to deal with that we just can't seem to escape. But it may be an affliction we'll have to live with the rest of our life. Well, you can live with it quite a bit differently if you live with it with that understanding rather than think, well, you know, why did God single me out? Why am I the only one that uh, is, is, is sick like this? When other people have their health and their strength and they can go out and, and I don't. If we see what God is really doing with us and what he has in reward for us and the relative differences between the reward for the kingdom age and what we go through now, then, yeah, I think he would agree with the Apostle Paul. My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And you think about what Paul would have thought when he was, when he was captured, taken prisoner, no longer able to go and visit around Europe like he, he might have thought he could. And by being a prisoner we got letters. And he preached to far, far more people through his letters than he ever would have had he just gone around and only talked to people without writing those letters. 
must all see the wisdom of God behind the actions which seem to be rather severe in people's lives. So here was a man who, who was possibly going to be exalted above measure. What good is it for a man who, who takes glory in himself and what God's done for him? No, we, we glory in what God does for us. And so my strength is made perfect in weakness, he says. Now I've had a little fun with this one because it's interesting to ask people in, the, in public if they would underwrite that if they were in the insurance business. If anybody had a policy out there, is there any company that would underwrite that and say, yeah, we'll underwrite that? That's Romans 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And just ask if someone who, who wants to sell you insurance could sell you that policy. I want you to ensure that everything that happens in my life happens for my good. Both the good things and the evil things. So someday I, I get a, you know, a promotion at work and, and you might consider that a good thing. Well, I want to make sure that works for good. And then one day I lose my job and I want to make sure that works for my good. And I come home and my house has been burned down. I want to make sure that works for my good. There wouldn't be an insurance company anywhere in the world that could underwrite that. No one would be so foolish. This is God's domain. But that's what he says. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That's only God could ever do that. And if you believe it that way, then you, you look for the good of whatever has happened to you or what is happening to us as a community. What good will come out of this? And we have to be patient because God works over longer periods of time. 25 years for Adam or for Abraham and Sarah to have a child. 25 years. You know, when Jonah got sent to his room for his misbehavior, it was three and a half nights, days and nights, uh, in a fish. You go send a kid to the room for five minutes. But God works on a different timetable. And these things are there to illustrate that, yes, all things do work together for good to them that love God. And then you see something like this, and uh, this is a, a little more difficult to grasp, but it, it's just one of the many things that the philosophy of the truth gives to us to have a different view of stress than the people around us. So when Paul was talking to the elders of Ephesus, as it's recorded in Acts 20, verses 34 and 35, he says, Yea, yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, he says, I have showed you all things so that laboring, his laboring, you ought to support the weak. And he gave them an example of that. He, he was a good role model in these matters. And to remember, therefore, the words of the Lord Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive. He could have received. He said that. Like, there's a, there's a you know, a God really interested in oxen, that he said that, you know, he shouldn't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. No, he was thinking of trying to show to the people that he went to from city to city how to live. So just a wonderful example of the Apostle Paul. But there is something in the saying, it's more blessed to give than to receive, because very often when a person's under great stress, they're in receive mode. What can you do to help me? You know, go to mom, go to dad, and say, I, I, don't, I just can't seem to handle this. What can I do? In many cases, it's, it's the way you receive it mentally. If you got out there and you tried to do what you could to help other people, quite often your own ailment doesn't seem to be so great anymore. And I just think the philosophy of the truth is absolutely wonderful. And I just want to leave our talk tonight here because it, it's beautiful to see again how God, the beauty of God, I mean, you could just sit down and, and just be amazed at little things like this. You know, a piece of rock, and there's a little crack in it, and a little earth in it, 
And up come these beautiful little flowers, just little tiny things, and they're just beautiful little flowers. That's our God at work. And he can make that in our life rather than all the ugly things that happen when it becomes too stress. So we read again, Numbers 6, verses 24 to 26. Yahweh bless thee and keep thee. Yahweh make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Thank you.